plywood to build the doghouse, and he notices that the concussive vibrational force of each blow on a nail transferred through the plywood is causing the ash to vibrate and mound up. I kind of like that theory. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> I like it's, it too. It's very simple at its root. Yeah. I understand that. Well, and also clay behaves fairly similarly to ash once it's wet. Well, I think the clay represents, in this case, the plywood, and then all, oh. all the loose stuff Joe's on top right. is here. Oh, yeah. then never mind. I don't like it okay. anymore. So basically... <laughs> <laughs> no, clay is very much like plywood. The theory is the dirt of the Mima Mound, or the Mima Plain, is like the ash. The, the clay and the bedrock are like the board. Mm. And every time there's seismic activity and those seismic waves are rattling around underneath that crust and they're hitting fractures and, and whatever the case may be down there, they're making that vibration, which is causing that soil to, for lack of a better term, kind of clump up and boil up. Yeah. Okay. My problem with this is if that were the normal case, again, why don't we see that in other areas? And there is a practical example that I want to point to, which causes me some concern because he's saying that there is some serious seismic activity that is going through the area not low grade but it seems it needs to be a relatively big bunch of seismic I activity. I would think so to, in order to do this kind of thing. Yeah. There's really a lot of pounds of dirt. The example that I'm going to point to is a location in California which is another place that mounds like this are found. Okay. In the 50s We'd kind of talked about this in some other, possibly in some other places, but in the 50s, those mounds were plowed under for farmland. Okay. Plowed them down in the 80s, that farmland was abandoned for farming. Mm. And lo and behold, mounds began to arise again on their own. Okay. Uh, huh? Yep. The, uh, the mounds have started to come back in that area. That truly leaves me with more questions than answers. Well, yeah, because it's only been like, what, 35 years, yep. 30 years? So yeah. it couldn't yeah. have been any... We've had, what, two major, and I use air quotes here, major, major earthquakes in the that region of California, kind of that Bay Area, Northern California yeah. area. There hasn't been, it's not like the place has been rocking and rolling for a long time. There's been a couple of them. There's been a couple of decent sized ones. But, down but that's there, it. But, uh, yeah. but this theory seems to say that they're, they infer that it's got to be kind of a big thing to shake that much soil around long term for it to clump up that much, and yet it's still happening. I just that 30 years later. Oh, <laughs> the fact yeah, that they reform like that. There's no moles. There's no I and there's no termites and no there's termites. clearly not glaciers egg cartoning the things. Nope. Uh, nope. No. No, gla- no glaciers. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think kinda, I, I think kinda, kinda that, threw you for a loop there, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think what it is is the soil is, is forming around and reflecting like massive structures built underneath and buried by aliens. Yeah. Okay, Joe, <gasps> stop. We're yeah. moving on. Yeah. Uh, before you start making up something that confuses our listeners because it's all made up, uh, <laughs> we're going to go to the next theory, which is actually real, which I think is a very solid one as well is the shrinking and swelling of the clay layer of soil. If you guys remember earlier in the beginning, we talked about how the B and the C layers of horizons Mm -hmm. have clay in them, and the density of clay can vary, so it's a low density or a high density. So some layers are very, very thick with clay and some are not. That might be the simplest answer of what's responsible, and here's why. Clay, though it doesn't seem to absorb water, does. Have either of you had to dig in dirt that was full of clay? Yeah, the worst. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. My, my yard is full of it, and I di- I hate digging in it in the wintertime because it's just a sticky, mat- nasty mess. But actually, that's a lot better than digging in it in the summertime it is. when it's hard <laughs> as a freaking rock. Yeah. It is better. <laughs> yeah. 
it turns out, I, I, I never realized this until I started doing the research, is that, yeah, clay does absorb water, and it absorbs it at varying ratios, because depending on the mineral count and the density of the clay... It can absorb more or less. In other words, think of it this way. There's pockets in between in the clay. So if it's really dense, there's not a lot of pockets of areas that water can get into. But if it's a low density, there's a lot of areas that that water can infiltrate. And those thinner areas will swell as the water gets in. So what that means is that as it swells, it's got, it can't push down into the bedrock, so it's going to push up, and it's going to push everything above it upwards. Mm -hmm. Well, the areas in between the mounds are very thin. They're very dense. They can't absorb a lot of water, so they don't really expand. Although, then the clay drays that dries out, and it goes flat again. That's kind of what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) There, I have seen some research, and the validity of this I cannot stand behind, but I will put out, is that as things expand from water, and then that water drains out and evaporates, they will collapse, but they will not compact their original volume. They will stay larger. Think about it. You you stick a sheet of water or a sheet of paper in water, mm-hmm. and it gets all wet. And then you dry it out, and then it's all puffy and rough. Yeah. And it's a little thicker. Not much, but it's a little thicker. That's fair. Mm-hmm. Now think about a two foot thick layer of dirt that that fills with water and puffs up. Mm-hmm. It's gonna shrink back down a little bit. But it's not going to go all the way down to what it was originally. That's fair. Yeah, and it would help explain why mounds were reforming. I think the key is for us to get some shovels and go up to, um, well, no, maybe. (laughs) But there there should be a a big (laughs) pocket. uh, Like, even even in the dry times, there should be a big hollow pocket underneath these things. So let's go Mm -hmm. punch through some of those mounds and see what's underneath there. Let's not do that. Joe is always wanting a field trip that requires everybody else to do manual labor while he sits in his director's chair with the umbrella over him and a Mai Tai in his hand saying, Dig there! This is not happening. No. Yeah. Okay, uh, We've done that too many times already. <laughs> yeah. No. I, I know. Sorry, Forest Park. Uh, yeah. Our final theory is... Are you ready, Devin? What? Aliens! Yeah! yeah. Not really. Yeah. Oh. Makes sense. Why not? Uh, aliens, when you read about the Mima Mounds, are all over the place. Oh, yeah. yeah. Everybody's like, they were done for aliens. They were done for aliens. I really am afraid that the alien connection here was made up sarcastically by a bunch of witty writers to be able to immediately discount it because every time you see something about aliens, it says, but there's no evidence. And why? There really is. There's nothing that says why aliens would do it. Because aliens... No corresponding information. It is just... Three sentences, and then they move on to the rest of their story. Now, it's, it's very well documented that aliens, aliens uh, historically come to the Earth, they do random stuff, and then they leave again. I mean, the, so the bottom does, of their ships are formed like egg crates, and that's their landing pads? Uh, well, that, it could be that, or it could, it could be that actually these, these things are, are kind of like Morse code dots in the, sur- in the surface of the planet. And when we got... And it says, eat here? No, yeah. <laughs> no it, it says, hi, we are aliens. Just wanted to stop by and say hello. You know? <laughs> and when we eventually manage to decode the message, and I'm sure the NSA is on it, mm. you know, then that will be the first message from another race. I, just, I mean, I think mm. more times than not, we try to assign a meaning that we as lowly humans could possibly understand to alien activity right if we're assuming that aliens exist which we are of course because they Mm -hmm. do but there's no way that our puny little tiny not being able to go out into space and travel through all of that could possibly comprehend what they may or may not have been doing so they might have had very good reasons for doing it. we just don't know what it is yeah exactly so yeah um all right so there's another theory that's much overlooked oh boy yeah Let's have it. 
In this particular area, southeast of Tacoma, the dominant tribe in the area before uh, the white man showed up was the, P the Puyallup Indians. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the Indians were noted for not having internet or cable or anything. <laughs> that was and, their main quality. Yeah. They had a lot of time on their hands. And so they spent their time just building mounds because kind of like the Incas spent their time shaping stone and building these incredible stone structures, they made these really cool sort of moundy areas. I don't think that's true. I, yeah. yeah, no. The fact that we see mounds re-rising in other areas, I, I can't agree with that. The, the, yeah. the other hard part about this is, okay, again, we've only focused in this episode on the Mima Mounds. There are mounds in the south of the United States, in the Californias, they're in Europe, they're in Africa. I mean, this this geologic structure happens for multiple reasons in multiple areas. So to just say, well, this particular one is because people were bored. I'm, people, I'm not yeah. going to buy into John. No, no, actually. I'm just going to tell you right now. No, no, actually, I think that uh, even though this theory has been put forward by many prominent scientists, I don't take it too seriously myself. Uh, was I, that prominent scientist your cat? <laughs> no, somebody liked my cat. Okay. Anyway, uh, I just want to throw, throw that in for fun. Obviously, there's there's an interesting process, which perhaps someday our grandchildren will, will understand here. But uh, possibly, yeah, we don't quite get it yet. Well, that's that's the theories that we've got. Obviously, none of them fit or are perfect, though some of us subscribe to others more than some. Mm -hmm. That that made sense, I swear. It did. Uh, <laughs> if you want to take a look at some of the research that we've done on this particular episode, you can find that on our website. That website is thinkingsidewayspodcast.com. Of course, we have the episodes there to stream, but chances are you're listening to and downloading us somewhere else. There are a bazillion streaming sources out there, and we are on pretty much all of them. So you can find us there. If you use iTunes, which I know a good portion of people do, please, when you're there, take it the time to, to subscribe and then leave the comment and the rating. Because, of course, that helps other folks find us, which is great because other people need to find us. That's what we want. Uh, we are on Facebook. So we have the group and the, uh, this, the Facebook page, which is ever growing and tons and tons of fun conversations going on there so anybody can join let us know uh joe's favorite phrase is is it find us friend us like us um no i think it's uh yes i think it find is find it. us friend us yes. like us yeah okay that's close enough I, but i think i put it a little more emphatically like find us friend us like us well, Please. emphatically saying, I'm not going to say that. Uh, well, you can also find us on Twitter. We are on Twitter at Thinking Sideways. So drop the G off of thinking. And you can follow us on there. We put some stuff out on Twitter. And, of course, if you have thoughts or story suggestions, agreements, disagreements, love, hate, anything like that that you want to send us and you want us to read, you can send that to us at our email, which is thinking sideways podinkingsidewayspodcast at gmail.com. Don't uh, have anything else that I can think of to say well, here that they I did need wanna, to know? I did want to add this one thing, and that is that if you have a shovel and, you're, and you want to build a, no. a mime amount of your Stop own, it, Joe. No. we'll post instructions. No! We're, this this is not a uh, Instructables website. We're not going to tell them how to build their own mime amount. We're not amount. stuff you should know. <laughs> not, I, you know I, I'm sorry. Who doesn't want a mime amount of their very own? Mm. Uh, I know someone, and I live with them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, she would not not be happy if I built a six foot by a hundred and sixty foot mound in our backyard. You'd well, also have to have a bigger yard. Yeah, sure. there's that. But well, might, you know what? My might attract growth. Yeah, my neighbors yeah. don't want that. So yeah, and it, yeah, you might bring in gophers and termites too. You <laughs> See? never know. Bad idea, Joe. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna go ahead and roll this one up, put it in the can, and call it done. And we'll talk to you next week. Ta ta, everybody. Bye, guys. It was probably gophers, but. Not yeah, really. Probably gophers. Thinking Sideways is not brought to you by that company named after a rain diverting device.
Instead, it's supported by the generous contributions of people like you, our listeners, on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash thinking sideways to learn more. Thinking sideways. I don't understand. Does not compute. You never know. What? Stories of things we simply don't know the answer to. Hey everybody, and welcome again to another episode of Thinking Sideways. I am Steve, of course, as always, joined by... Joe. And Devin. And this week we have a phenomena I want to talk about. Mysterious mm. phenomena. phenomena. Yeah, it's kind of... Dude. <laughs> Actually, this mystery sucks. <laughs> I think it's good. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, yeah, kidding. well, listen, here... Let me tell these people before you, you trot all over it, Joe, what, what we're going to talk about. They right. know. They read the description. Maybe. Maybe, maybe. not. But what we're going to talk about is we're going to be talking about the Min Min Lights, uh, This, which are, for people who don't know, they're a phenomena that has been witnessed in the Australian Outback for... I don't think you pronounced that right. The Australian Outback? Yeah, I don't have that accent, oh. so mm-hmm. thanks for thanks for the help, yeah. but yeah. no, I'm not doing it. Okay. And that's not to be confused with the Australian back out. That's <laughs> totally a different thing. It uh, has been reportedly observed in the outback for hundreds of years, and the lights are described as... They look, they well, look, they're, they're like floor lamps. Uh, people. They've been described as a lot of different things. Uh, their behavior and their color, as well as any sound or smells that they may or may not make um it's ever changing from one witness to a next so yeah, they're yeah. kind of hard to pin down mm-hmm. the only thing that really connects all the various sightings is like mushrooms no yeah no that's not what connects them Joe. i see mushrooms in this yeah yeah see you the, see mushrooms I, in everything I see the deadly hand of mushrooms <laughs> uh, well before before joe gets us too off topic i do want to say that this was a listener suggestion uh, this was suggested by Alex quite a while ago, and I know that some other people have sent it to us since then, so thank you for the suggestion. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Alex. Um, so let's get into trying to describe and explain the Min Min Lights. Simplest description is, like I said, they're lights that are seen at night by people who are driving or camping in the outback. The most common description is that they're they're kind of a, a whitish-colored, round light. Sometimes Unless they're not. Sometimes they're dim, sometimes they're bright. Usually there's one, but sometimes there can be multiple. Uh, They hover in the distance somewhere between 3 to 20 feet off of the ground, which would be 1 to 6 meters off of the ground. The the general behavior of the Min Min Lights is that they keep their distance from people. Uh, So if a person sees it and tries to approach the light's retreat... But on the flip side, if you try to retreat from the Min Min Lights, they follow you. So they seem to keep the same distance from you? No yes, it's what? always okay. a consistent distance okay. from the viewer, typically. Mm-hmm. And it's always like a, a fair distance, right? It's not... Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, know, yeah. Well, yeah, it's five usually... five feet off. I mean, some, some people have a, a reported them approaching kind of close. Mm-hmm. But then again, you know, they might have been on mushrooms. I don't know. No. Uh, Apparently that's the theory. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, um, so, yeah, yeah. no, they, they tend to be a distance away. The lights have been seen by motorists who have said that they've uh, seen the lights while they were traveling at highway speeds, so 60 miles an hour or 100 kilometers per hour. And the lights never fell behind if sometimes they actually appear to gain some distance, so they actually caught up with people. But... It seems like the descriptions always, they, they imply that the lights are kind of playful, but I've also heard on the, the opposite side of the spectrum the stories that people who try to follow the lights never return, so there's that kind of danger aspect mm. there, mm-hmm. mm. um, which I, I honestly, i got to be telling you, I chalk that up to wandering around in the dark, staring at something ahead of you and not watching where you're walking. That's right, yeah. and then you fall, you knock your head, you're, and then the dingo eats you. Yeah, and then, so... Yeah. I mean, especially if you're staring at a light. Right, and mm-hmm. it's dark everywhere else, and you're kind of burning out your night vision, and it, then you look for something, and psh, done. Spot on, exactly. Yeah. Actually, I don't know how many people have actually been killed pursuing the, the, these lights. I don't know. Yeah, I guess that, that number know. is not reported because they were never seen again. Because the dango eats them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now, 
The description that we've given here of the Miniman lights probably sounds familiar because depending on where you are in the world, this kind of light has been described just about everywhere. You'll hear them called the jack-o'-lantern lights, will-o'-wisps, ghost lights, ghost candles, and then there's like locales, so there's places where they actually get a local name, much like the Min Min lights. So you hear the Marfa lights, the yeah, Hassendalen lights. Marfa, Texas. Yep. Yeah, yeah. We um, talked about one of those, didn't we? No. We haven't talked about lights? No. I don't no. Think so, no. no. There's been suggestions about lighters. Marfa lights. We've talked about swamp gases and stuff mm. like that, but not any That's one not particular. This. this is our first actual light phenomena that we've gone over. Yeah. Wow. We're breaking new ground. Don't forget the Marlboro lights. We don't ever talk about those either. Well, um, yeah, we'll okay. someday. So let's start off with something that's really easy to, to, to define, and that's the name of the lights. Uh, because it, it turns out that they are primarily seen in one area, which is in Queensland, Australia, between the towns of Boulia and Winton. Uh, between those two, there used to be a settlement called Min Min. And from what I've read, it was a pretty wild and, and raucous kind of place, and kind of lawless. And they had a, what I've heard. A, a pub. It was Deadwood. It was kind yeah. of Deadwood esque. Kind of like that. They had a pub, and it apparently lived up to the reputation of the town as well. But mm -hmm. before you get uh, and, and go and try and book your next vacation there, don't because it burned down at the turn of the 19th century. And I have heard that uh, it might have been a case of arson. You know, I, I read that, but I didn't. I didn't really focus too much on it, so I, I don't mean, know. You know, I mean, obviously, it's easy to burn a place down accidentally. It happens all the time, especially when your main source of light is fire. No, uh -huh. that doesn't help. Yeah. So, sorry, we're talking about the turn between the 18th and 19th century. Correct. Okay. No, no, between the 19th and 20th, right? It burned down in like 19. 10 or 1916, okay. somewhere in okay. there. Okay, early 20th century then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm okay. sorry. I said 19th, didn't I? It's, it's confusing. It is. Because I've complained worst. about this before. It's bad. That's the worst. Yeah, it's, it's a bad system. <laughs> we should get rid of it. Mm -hmm. um, so, <laughs> talking about the phenomena itself, it's like I had mentioned a little bit earlier, it's not new to the area. According to the indigenous peoples, there's legends that talk about lights like this having been around for before the white man came to the continent. Mm -hmm. uh, but the story is also, they're a little confusing and conflicting because it, it's, there's some that say that it, the lights were observed before, uh, you know, settlers came. But then there's also stories that say that they, the sightings have increased since settlers came. Mm -hmm. And there's also stories that blame the lights on the settlers who have killed, uh, you know, indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. This was like in the, I think it was between the, 1850s and 1880s, there was a, a number of kind of slaughters, and those were pointed to as well. Those are the souls of those people. So it's yeah. it's it's I, I can never get a clear read on this is the story that was there before it morphed in. Well, you know, the cool thing about legends is that um, different groups of people can have different legends and so those could all be the original legends because mm -hmm. you know each group or tribe or whatever doesn't necessarily have to you know agree on when yeah they don't have to be or where exactly the from. same yeah i mean it's the um the, the flood legend yeah that's yeah. the biblical flood that legend has been through a whole bunch of cultures so it's, it has been around a while yeah. or and like obviously, angels yeah. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, there's flying beings from the sky that a lot of cultures have, but like... We all call them something different. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Absolutely. Next time on Thinking Sideways. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, these, these, these stories are told around the campfire, and obviously they are going to diverge because mm -hmm. well, and, and that's tribes the thing. don't talk to one another. In fact, they usually try to kill one another. And it's an oral. You know? Most of them have the oral tradition, so yeah. the stories are going to morph over time. So, yeah. Of course. Yeah. There's, there's a whole bunch of reasons why they're not pinned down or not mating up. But interestingly enough, they do seem to occur. Like, for example, the local, the local Native American in our in our area, mm -hmm. you know, here in the Pacific Northwest, they don't tell stories about mysterious lights. And but they do in the outback, they do tell stories about mysterious lights. Yeah, something seems to be going on. Yeah, yeah, it's a conspiracy. Yeah, probably it's a controversy. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so what what I'm gonna do here is is 
as I talked about, there's so many different descriptions of the lights that it, it makes it hard to say exactly what's going to go on or what they are, what they look like, how they act. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do something different. I'm going to kind of different for me and I'm going to do, I'm going to go through some accounts to help highlight some things and we'll take this in chronological order as Devin is about to burst in excitement because she thinks I, it. I'm winning. <laughs> Do you see a single bullet point? No, but I didn't have bullet points on my last one. My last one looked almost exactly like this. With bullet points in it. It didn't have Anywho, bullet points. We're going to move into accountings because um, there's a, there's a number of them. I've picked a handful of them uh, through time just to kind of help. You've curated the stuff. list. I have. I have. Absolutely. I've tailored it maybe. There are a lot of sightings out there, yes. Yeah. And I'm glad that you pared it down somewhat because I don't want to bore the hell out of our listeners. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> so let's go ahead and start start with the first one. Uh, this, this is the first white guy story. It, this is the, the first story that is from a white person. And I, actually, I think almost all of these are, but that's not the point. Yeah. The story comes from the early 1800s. We don't have an exact date. I've seen it listed 1830, 1820, 1810. It's all over the map, but it's the most common one because it references the stockman, which if you don't know what a stockman is, it's a cattle herd. No, Simple I version. Was, I thought it was a guy that stocked the like, the, the, the stores, yeah, yeah, at the yeah. local Albertsons. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, no, no. okay. That so there's wrong. a there's a stockman. He's working near the the Min Min settlement, and sometime in the early evening, he said he saw a glow appear in the local graveyard. Oh yeah, and by then the way, drift I, away. I don't know if you mentioned that. Uh, a lot of people got killed in Min in the settlement of Min Min because yeah. it was the Wild West there. Yes, and they did have a little graveyard there. Yes, they yeah. did. Yeah, yeah. So well, as with my, every town was, in that time frame, there's going to be a graveyard because people are dying all the time. Time. People are dying like flies. Yeah, I mean, like, especially yeah. in a, a rough yeah. and tumble area. Yeah. So he, he sees this light in the graveyard, and he said it started to drift away, and he described it as being about the size of a watermelon. And Is this an American watermelon or an Australian watermelon? He said it was the size of a watermelon, uh, at oh, which right. point he decided that uh, a watermelon-sized light floating around was probably not something he wanted to be near, and he wanted to get away from it. He was afraid of a watermelon. Watermelon. So he rode his horse towards the town of Bulia and it followed him. And it wasn't until he got to town itself that the light disappeared. He went to the local police or constable, whatever the case may be for that particular location. And he reported it. But of course, they didn't believe him. Yeah, go figure. In typical police fashion. Yeah. Well, strangely enough, there were two more reports that came in. And again, as with stories like this, the time frames vary, but I'll just give you the second one, which is I think it happened a day or so later. There was a couple who I think came it was in. Like two to three days. Yeah, well, see, like that's that. that's the hard yeah. part. It's the two or three accounts, days between each one. Accounts always vary, you know. They do. But this couple came in to the police, and they said they'd seen a light in the area, and they'd watched that it got brighter, and then it started to move away. So they decided not very wisely to to follow it. After a short bit, decided that was a bad idea idea and retrace their steps at which point the light followed them mm. and w the story doesn't say exactly when the light disappeared but they got to town and then of course gave their story so that's one of the earliest versions of the story their accountings we'll then move forward to either june or july of 1912 i don't know which and there is a guy by the name of henry lamond lamond said he was traveling in the early hours of the morning Morning on horseback when he saw what he believed to be the headlights of a car somewhere between five or ten miles away. Uh, the thing to note here is that if you think about a car that far away, it's going to be a single light far enough that the headlights aren't going to stand out as individual headlights. Yeah. And I, I, I recall from his uh, his account, he thought they were acetylene car headlights. Yeah, because it had a bit of a greenish tinge to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Apparently, yeah, early car headlights were he headlights were not just electric. You know, they they had different methods of doing it. Weird. And, yeah. As I mean, as with a lot of things with cars in the very beginning, everybody yeah. was doing it their own way, and some were better than others. 
tires. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so he sees this car, and he said the the light was coming his direction, and then and he thought that it was moving about ten miles an hour. And there were two. Well, it was still oh. one, oh. and when it got close enough that he figured that if it was a car, they should have split. It didn't split. the The light was five to ten feet off of the ground, and they he and the light passed each other. I I understand that he believed the light was on the road. He, however, it sounds like was not on the road because it wasn't like they passed, you know, close to one another. But he said the light traveled for about 200 yards uh, and then it just sort of faded away. So he was just off-roading? I'm guessing that he he was... Um, it, it was something seem... to do with, he, he was in the sheep trade. And I know he was going from one place to another. He'd left like four in the morning because he had to be there first light mm-hmm. to start working. And I, I think it was shearing season, if I remember right. And I, this, this is totally from memory because mm-hmm. his story is one of a bunch. But right. Well, that, his story significantly departs from the other stories. Because in, the other, in almost all these stories, you cannot catch up with the light. And in this one, he not only caught up with it, it passed him and went by him. He's not the only one that gets close to it, though. Yeah. But, I mean, it was, but, it, but it, this is, this, I do this because this is a slice of different styles of stories. So, I'm sorry, maybe I missed it. Did he have the impression that he, the car was heading towards him or Correct. it overtook him? It was heading towards him. So they he were headed in opposite distance, directions. They were heading towards each other. Weird. A little bit. Yeah, weird. So we'll move forward uh, just a year in time to 1913. This is a very simple one. There was some folks who were um, who were out in the evening hours, and they said they saw a ball of light traveling about five feet off the ground, and it passed their buggy as if quote unquote it was controlled by something uh, but it didn't seem to be going uh, just like Lamont's story they thought it was maybe going about 10 miles an hour it was a drone obviously obviously <laughs> Buggy, were they I mean was it uh, the impression I have of of Henry right is that it's a like a highway kind of situation right as much as he's West. taking the track that on his horse and it's going down the main road is that what you yeah. get that because i think that's what it is yeah but the roads i mean uh, yeah it's just weird because then you've got buggies and but you've also got cars and it's weird to me weird to me that somebody in that t- day and age would just assume like that's a car because cars are the only things at that time that are making lights bright enough. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I was thinking, too. Cars were not that rare in Australia at the time, even, even in the outback. Yeah. But it's funny to me, right, that we're, we're talking about, like, people who are not in cars saying, well, that's a car. Huh? <laughs> right? I mean, if cars are so ubiquitous at this time. They were not ubiquitous at that time. Right, but yeah. so then but they were like, common then why enough that you knew what it was. Maybe. And- I mean, you know what it is, but that you would initially say, like, that looks like a car to me. I don't know. I guess for me, it's just like a weird thing. Yeah. I don't know. I, I get it. I get it. I don't know why it's weird. It's uh, I don't know why you, it is either, but yeah, sorry. Well, I don't know. Sorry. So the next one that I've got for us is from the 10th of February, 1951. So a we considerable jumped ahead. jump. Well, yeah, I had to because there's so many of them. You just have to jump. I, I'm sure there's lots jumps. and lots of people that saw them in oh, the yeah. time. I'm sure. Uh, so this is from a man named Mr. C. Rhodes. And Mr. Rhodes. No, that's standing for Cecil. Is it? I have no idea. Okay. (laughs) Mr. Rhodes said that at about 8.30 at night, he saw the light hovering in the sky about 15 feet in the air, and it was moving from east to west. Uh, And then as he described it, it moved about 40 degrees, which I'm I'm assuming when he's saying the east to west, it traveled about 40 degrees on the compass. Mm. Yeah. Um, at so which, I travel, say, from true north to about, you know, for, north, northwest. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, and then he said once it did that, it then started to bounce up and down in the sky really fast, very quickly, mm. at which point, until it finally it stopped, held steady, a cloud went by, and it went behind the cloud, but he said he could see it bouncing up and down, peaking above and below the cloud, and then when the cloud eventually went by, it was static in its original position again, and then it zipped away. I have a question for you. Okay. Isn't February in Australia summer? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Would it have actually been dark at 8.30 p.m. in February? That's a good question. What's the latitude of this place? 
I, I don't know the latitude and I don't know what time it gets dark there in February.